a story of man's triumph over is much milder than its name would imply, since the entire south coast of Iceland is worn by the Gulf Stream. Here's how it got its unattractive name. A Norwegian Viking named Floki sailed to Iceland about 870 AD and landed on the north coast where he spent a miserable winter among the ice flows which are often brought to the north coast by the Greenland current. He returned to report that the new country was truly a land of ice, an ice land. But other Vikings still came, first Ingo for Arnarsson, then others. Leif Erikson, an Icelander by birth, sailed west to finally reach the New World in the year 1000 at what was probably the coast of Labrador. Some scientists believe that Leif called the new country Vinland the land of vines because he mistook the wild cranberries growing there for a species of grape. Approaching Iceland from America, ships usually pass just south of Greenland where ice flows are a common sight even in summertime. However, when Iceland nears, the water becomes much warmer and the distant view of that country shows its overall green appearance and its interesting coloring. Iceland is an extremely volcanic island. This is Mount Hecla, which erupted as recently as 1948. Almost all of the very fertile soil the original Viking settlers found there, as well as the extensive forests they found, have in the past thousand years been covered by a heavy coating of sterile volcanic material. Only tiny flowers grow on the moss covering the lava. Today, forests are almost non-existent and very little of Iceland's area can be used for agriculture. Nevertheless, farms are maintained by the hardy farmers, such as this one on the lava plains of Thingvellir, where the world's first parliament was established by the Icelanders in 930 AD. This woman in her Sunday dress at the farm at Thingvellir gives us a glimpse of the national costume of Iceland. Hard physical labor on the farms has not removed from these hardy people their inborn desire for education and literature. Iceland is one of the only nations in the world that can boast of having no illiteracy. On the lonely farms in the country, for generations past, their greatest relaxation has been the reading aloud of the famous Icelandic sagas written in the 12th century. So pure has their language remained that school children today can readily read the 12th century literature. Through hard physical labor, the Icelanders have made fields of grain and grass grow in former lava field areas. Here is a scene typical of modern Iceland. Another sign of the volcanic activity found all over Iceland is the area of pure sulfur hills in the north near Mývat in a section called Reykjali. Commercial use of this sulfur is not possible at present because of the isolated location of the deposits and also the high transportation costs to bring it to the world markets. Everywhere in Iceland are found amazing hot springs and fantastic pools of bubbling mud. These are a sign of the tremendous heat of the center of the earth, which here in Iceland comes so close to the surface. However, these hot springs and erupting geysers are not merely scenic. Faced by the need for an inexpensive fuel in an almost forestless land, the people have developed a unique method of utilizing the hot springs. A typical example of what they can do can be seen in the town of Kveragerti, where everyone has a private hot spring in his own backyard. Hot springs are capped here, much as oil wells are capped, and the heat and moisture are used to heat greenhouses, in which are grown many beautiful flowers, fruits and vegetables. 
Tomatoes are plentiful here in Iceland because of this method of growing them. Even delicious grapes grown in the hothouses are available in the shops of all of the cities. Bananas can even be grown here in Iceland using this method. In these water tanks is kept almost boiling water from the hot springs, water which is piped into Iceland's capital city Reykjavik with 55,000 population to heat the entire city all year round. The many waterfalls of Iceland provide the electric power for cooking and electric lights. This is Gudlfoss, the Golden Falls. From this effective utilization of the meager natural resources of Iceland, there has developed interesting bustling cities like Reykjavik, with its fine buildings like the National Theater. The University of Iceland, founded in 1911, but with a long heritage of past training. Modern churches like this one at Leugarnes. solid-looking, well-built modern homes, and even outdoor hot water swimming pools. This sturdy living has developed a fine-looking nation of people. Here, some of the young men are demonstrating Icelandic wrestling, called glima. In this type of wrestling, sportsmanship is all important. Here is a charming young modern Icelandic miss. This young lady recently won the title of Miss Airways over competitors from all over the world. Here's another very typical Icelandic miss. Let's have her tell us something about her language. My name is Hatla Guðmundsdóttir of Hafnarfjörður, Iceland. It's a newspaper in Icelandic language. This language was spoken all over Scandinavia a thousand years ago when the Vikings settled my country. In the rest of Scandinavia, the language developed into Swedish, Norwegian, and Danish. In Iceland, because of our isolation, the language remained exactly as it was a thousand years ago and today we still speak the original language of the Vikings. We still carry on an ancient custom giving children a last name which is derived from their father's first name. For example, the children of a father named Einar Guðmundsson would have the last name of Einarsson or Einarsdóttir since the last name merely tells the world that they are the son or daughter of Einar. For her main industries for world commerce, Iceland looks to the sea. Here is the whaling station at Kvalfjörður, where whales are cut into small pieces to be boiled down to whale oil. At Siglfjörður in the north, a tremendous herring industry has sprung up. These are some of the herring fishing boats coming in from the fishing banks. Here the herring are cut and salted for shipment all over the world. Back at Reykjavik, at a public meeting, we have a chance to see again the unique Icelandic costume worn by most of the older women. These people have a long heritage of freedom and democracy. Iceland was independent until it voluntarily joined with Norway in 1262. In 1380, Norway came under the domination of Denmark, and Iceland also came under its rule. In 1944, Iceland became completely independent. Our young Icelandic miss will now give you a special message from the president of Iceland. The last paragraph of the message is a greeting in Icelandic. Iceland, that has been described by one of our poets as a strange medley of frost and fire, sends the people of the United States the greetings of her people. Our forefathers who came here over a thousand years ago, most of them from Norway, but some of them from the northern British Islands and Ireland, established a free commonwealth in this island early in the 10th century with a national assembly, the Althing, that was much like modern parliament. Nearly a thousand years ago, an Icelander, Leif Eriksson, 
discovered America and was the first white man to set his feet on your shores. We remember this when we recall the bonds of friendship that unite the peoples of the United States and Iceland. With the establishment of the Republic of Iceland in 1944, our wishes were fulfilled as regards the most practical form of government for a free and independent people. We are convinced that with the understanding and help of all the freedom-loving nations, Iceland will continue to stand as a true democracy at work. We wish you happiness and God's blessing. Vi er erum þess fullvissir að með skilningi og aðstór allra frelsisunnandi þjóða muni Íslandi auðnast að varðveita líðræði sitt í allri framkvæmd. Alvar óskir og Guðs friðar. This message has come to you from the president of Iceland to the people of the United States of America. And this film has shown how the people of Iceland overcame the calamity of nature which took away their forests for fuel and their fertile soil and made those very forces a help in making their nation a self-reliant democracy.